Oral questions, question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. After eight years in power, Prime Minister, our health care system is broken. He did the impossible. He was able to double our national debt by adding more inflationary debt than any other Prime Minister in our combined history without improving our health care system. In fact, it's worse than ever today. The Prime Minister even confessed that the system isn't up to our expectations. So will he finally take responsibility so that we can solve the issues that he has caused? The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Let's remind the member of the facts. During the pandemic, we gave the provinces $72 million extra to the $46 million that was set aside for provinces. And also, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and the provincial premiers are sitting down together to talk about how they're going to build a lasting health care system for the next 10 years. That's how our confederation works. It's a good day for Canada. Shifted. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Eight years, eight years of this Prime Minister, health care in Canada is broken. He's accomplished the impossible. He managed to double our national debt, adding more debt than all prior Prime Ministers combined, without improving health care. In fact, by his own admission, it is worse. Now, Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister finally take responsibility for the problems in health care he has caused so that we can fix what he broke? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Let's remember the facts. During the worst pandemic in a century, the Government of Canada transferred $72 billion to the provinces to make sure that we could get to the pandemic. On behalf of record investments of $46 billion, Mr. Speaker, today, the Prime Minister and all of the Premiers of this country are meeting to build a health care system that will be sustainable for the future. It's a great day for Canada and a great day for Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. After eight years of this Prime Minister, inflation is at its highest level in 40 years. In fact, the former finance Liberal Minister, Bill Morneau, said that the Prime Minister has spent too much. Another former, former Liberal Finance Minister, John Manley, said that these expenses are causing inflation. The current Governor of the Bank of Canada has said that the government's spending is causing domestic inflation, and Mark Carney, the future Liberal leader, is, agrees with this. Can the Prime Minister accept the responsibility for the inflation he has caused so we can fix what he broke? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Leader of the Opposition because, yes, we are going to take responsibility for all the investment we made in Canada, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Conservatives, we, for side, we forget that we've invested in science, Mr. Speaker in biopharmaceuticals across the country. We, we did this the, for the first time in Canada. So I think that the Leader of the Opposition forgets the investment we have made in the automotive sector. I think the Leader also forgets the investments we made in green energy. We are going to continue to invest in Canada to create jobs of today and tomorrow. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Investments in pharmaceuticals. He gave $170 million to a pharmaceutical yeah. operation that's shutting down. <laughs> which is a prime example after after 8 years of this prime this prime minister wasting our money inflation is at 40 year highs and now home heating bills have doubled seniors wonder how they're going to keep the heat on because this tax is going to be triple triple and triple under the NDP liberal coalition will the prime minister finally take responsibility for the misery he's put on household heating bills and Will he accept that we're going to keep the heat on to take the tax off? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, at the time we invested was to protect the health and safety of Canadians. At the time, Mr. Speaker, everyone in the country and Canadians watching today just watch this guy again. Everyone in this country understand that at the time we needed to invest in all families of vaccines. Today, Mr. Speaker, we're in solution mode. We want to protect the jobs of Medicago. We want to protect, obviously, the manufacturing facility and VIP. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know something out of the COVID. We have their back. We will continue to invest in the Canadian economy, Mr. Speaker. Thank you.
The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Canadians know that they don't have, this government doesn't have their back. The government has their hands in their back pockets. Yeah. That's what's happening. $170 million here for this uh, wasted investment, $54 million for the ArriveCan scam, and of course $2 billion invested in a company that doesn't actually exist. And who's paying for it? Well, people are now seeing the bills on their home heating, which is doubled. Higher gas prices. And of course, when you tax our farmers with a carbon tax and our truckers, they have to raise the price of the food that comes to our grocery stores. Will they finally back down from this crazy carbon tax scheme? Because we're going to keep the heat on until they take the tax off. The Honourable Minister for Families. coming from the Leader of the Opposition, but we don't hear a lot of solutions. On this side of the House, we're actually focused on making sure that Canadians have the support that they need. Whether that was at the height of the pandemic, when we made sure that Canadians could stay afloat, and guess what, Mr. Speaker, that's what the Leader of the Opposition is against, or whether it is now, when we are reducing childcare fees by 50 per cent across this country, and the Conservatives voted against funding childcare, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's against whether it's the chi Canada Child Benefit it's helping nine out of ten Canadian families. Mr. Speaker, we're there for them. Conservatives just aren't there for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister divides people. We saw it with his advisor against Islamophobia. He wanted to divide Quebecers and Canadians by supporting, once again, Quebec bashing. We see it again at the Official Languages Committee, where he sends his West Island MPs to bat against the protection of French. He wants to divide Quebecers by misinforming about the charter of the French language. Mr. Speaker, the role of a prime minister is not to divide people. Is his government going to call to order these federal members who are saying false things and saying, tell them this, that this is enough? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, the bloc was born to divide. That's their main objective. And here we're talking about a bill that will allow workers to work in French, and they're voting against it. A piece of legislation that will guarantee services in French, they're against it. More for French in Quebec and outside, they're going to vote against it. So when we talk about French and defending it, the bloc are talking about out of both sides of their mouth, the honourable member. The dispute is within his Quebec caucus and not at the bloc. La Bresse said this in this morning, the smoke and mirrors used by some of his colleagues is shameful. Montreal Island does not have a monopoly on language policy in Canada. Disinformation has no place in this debate. These are fair statements. How come it takes a member from Ontario to publish such things? How come we have not heard a single denunciation from a Quebec MP in the Liberal Party? Where are the Premier and his Quebec lieutenant when their colleagues are dragging the French language charter through the mud? The Honourable Minister of Official Languages. Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are the first government to recognize the French fact across the country, including in Quebec. We take our responsibility and have tabled a bill that has teeth to make sure that we do our fair share to protect French across our country, including in Quebec. Mr. Speaker, our government wants to do its fair share, and I hope that we will see a bill adopted as quickly as possible. Thank you. Vancouver Kingsway. Today's health summit, Canadians need this Prime Minister to champion public health care and stand against private for-profit delivery. Yeah. Right. Privatization is not innovation. Yeah. It drains workers from our public system, costs more, and allows queue jumping for the rich. It will make the crisis worse. Yes. Real innovation is better support for health professionals, shorter wait times in our hospitals, and access to care based on need. Will this Prime Minister assure Canadians that additional public dollars will go to public health care. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Madam Speaker, our health system is experiencing significant challenges and it's important that we work together to find best, the best solutions going forward and that's why today the Prime Minister and the Minister of Health is sitting down with the, the Premiers and the Ministers of Health from across this country and our government remains ready to work with provinces and territories to further discuss priorities, actions and results to improve the health services that Canadians rely on. That includes reducing backlogs and supporting our health care workers, enhancing access to family health services, improving mental health and substance use services, helping Canadians age with dignity, closer to home, and using health data and digital health more effectively. We'll always be there to support our universal public health care system. Thank you, Madam Minister. Well, member for Elmwood to Transcona. I didn't hear a word about standing up to privatization. I hope the minister is going to be able to do better after today's talks. Yeah. When this Prime Minister was looking for votes, he said he would do everything to defend, defend our public health care system. And now he's calling the tactic of privatizing our health care system innovation. Just the opposite. Let's be clear, privatization does not add workers to our public health care system. It removes them. Investment is needed to address this crisis by hiring more health care workers. Will the Prime Minister be clear today that the federal health funding cannot be used to privatize our health care system? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Perhaps my colleague didn't hear me when I said we'll always stand up for our fundamental uh, public universal health care. I'll say it again. We'll always stand up for our, our public universal health care. Et en français, Monsieur le Président. And in French, Mr. Speaker, our government is working with the provinces and territories to discuss priorities and results with respect to health care so we can enhance our health care system for all Canadians, particularly by reducing the backlog, uh, improving access to family services, improving services with respect to mental health and substance abuse and more. For Calgary, for Swan. After eight years with this Liberal Prime Minister, Canadians are suffering more than ever. His out-of-control spending fueled 40-year high in inflation. Rents have doubled. Home heating has doubled. And even food inflation has gone up. He piled drove Canadians further by taking more off their paychecks and was going to take even more and cause even more suffering when he triple, triple, triples his failed carbon tax scam. Will the Prime Minister show some humility and take the tax off so Canadians can keep the heat on. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Conservative politicians are making a lot of misleading claims about the price on pollution. The facts are that 70% of gas price increase is due to crude oil prices going up, largely because of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. And another 25% of the price is the result of provincial taxes and refined ma refining margins. Now, we started off fairly well, and now it seems to be going, well, it's not, go it's not doing well. I'm just going to ask everyone to listen to the questions and listen to the, response, sp the, the, the responses so that we can all hear together. The Honourable Minister, from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Conservative politicians are making a lot of misleading claims about the price on pollution. The facts are that about 70% of gas price increase is due to crude oil prices going up, largely because of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, and another 25% of the price is a result of provincial taxes and refining margins that have gone up by 113% in the last two years, Mr. Speaker. That means 95% of the gas price has nothing to do with the price on pollution. Mr. Speaker, the price on pollution puts more money back in 8 out of 10 Canadians in their pockets, and it remains one of the best ways to fight climate change. Well, Member for Calgary, for Swan. Maybe they should start taxing the hot air coming out of that minister's mouth. because they've missed every climate change target that they set. Liberal inflation is driving up food prices, and this failed carbon tax is contributing to one in five Canadian skipping meals. Will they finally show some humility and take off the tax so Canadians can keep the heat on? Or do they think that there's no business case for struggling Canadians to eat and heat their homes? The Honourable Minister for the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. According to British Columbia's Auditor General on 2021 disaster costs, the atmospheric rivers in British Columbia cost the province $5 billion of damages. That's more than the 19 previous years combined together. 
According to a study by McLean University, the cost of the Fort, Fort McMurray, the total cost of the Fort McMurray forest fires are above $10 billion, Mr. Speaker. $4 billion of damage to homes and businesses. $1.7 billion to loss of production to oil sands. Climate change is real, Mr. Speaker, no matter what the... The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. After eight years, eight years of this Prime Minister's carbon tax, Canadians continue to struggle. They continue to struggle to be able to heat their homes, to be able to feed their families, to be able to commute to work. Eight years, things are not looking better. Recently, a 70-year-old woman came into my office with her heating bill in her hand and tears down her face because she can't afford it. She's turned her thermostat down to 17. 17! It's minus 36 degrees outside. Shameful. So my question is very simple, and that is this. Why won't the government show a little compassion, take the tax off, so that Canadians can keep the heat on? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Regional Development. Times are tough for Canadians, but I want to remind the House of 105 homes in my riding that don't have to be heated anymore because they were destroyed by Hurricane Fiona. 105 families that no longer have a home. If you want to talk about why we need to address climate change, come visit the southwest coast of Newfoundland, sir. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. That is the answer of a government that is entirely out of touch with the needs of Canadians and the pain that they are truly feeling in this country right now. Another constituent of mine came in and he, he joked, he joked that to get from A to B in Canada, B now stands for broke. And what he was talking about was the need to be able just to get to work and the skyrocketing cost that has ensued there, the need to feed the family, the need to heat a home. These costs have gone up because of the Prime Minister's carbon tax. So once again, when will, the, when will the Prime Minister finally wake up to the reality that is out there, that Canadians are truly experiencing pain? And when will the Prime Minister decide to keep the heat on by taking the tax off? Oh, Minister for Immigration. Mr. Speaker, we know that Canadians are struggling, and that's why we continue to advance programs that put more money in their pockets. But I have spent seven years in this chamber watching the Conservatives use as an excuse that families may be in need to do nothing on climate change because they don't see that climate change is costing families dearly. Come to my community. You'll see houses that have been swept into the ocean. You'll see farms whose silos have been torn apart. You're going to see farmers who are out hundreds of thousands of dollars because of the impact of Hurricane Fiona on their crops. We have designed a program that puts more money in the pockets out of eight out of ten Canadian families and reduces pollution. I hope they get behind it instead of taking it. The Honourable Member for Megantique L'Erable. Eight years, eight years of this government, and after eight years of this Prime Minister, he seems to have learned nothing. Inflation is at a 40-year high, and young families are paying an average of $600 a month more because of interest rates. The cost of groceries is going up every week. The cost of housing and everything's going up. After eight years, what's the Prime Minister's solution? Triple, triple, triple the carbon tax. How come he is filling his pockets to the detriment of Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Sport. Mr. Speaker, did you not notice that not only the Conservatives have never offered a solution to help Canadians to face the hard time they're having right now with rising interest, rising interest rates, but they also have no solution to help Canadians tackle climate change and to fight the impact of climate change. So not only are they irresponsible, but it also shows how incompetent the Conservatives are with respect to helping Canadians with these issues. The Honourable Member from Megantique-Lerable, after eight years of this Liberal government, we see the incompetency every day in all Canadian families as well. 22 per cent have no more money left to deal with the worst inflation and cost of living crisis in 40 years. And women, 28 per cent of them cannot make ends meet at the end of the month. When we talk about incompetency of a government, this is what we're talking about. This is what Canadians are concerned about. But for the Liberals, everything's fine. Everyone is having a hard time, though. How come they are bent on digging into Canadians' pockets with the carbon tax? Why don't they help them by cutting the tax? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to remind some, my colleagues of some facts. Carbon tax was established in 2019, so it hasn't been eight, in place for eight years, not even for three years it's been in place. 
first. Second, it doesn't apply to Quebec because Quebec has a cap-and-trade system that applies. So my colleague from Quebec is absolutely wrong on this issue. And three, we give money back to eight out of ten Canadians. They receive more than they pay on the carbon tax. The Honourable Member for Lac-Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, tired of the hustle and bustle of the life in the Big Apple, exhausted by the pollution, crime and noise of the city? The solution for you is the all-inclusive Roxham package. A free bus will take you to Plattsburgh, where a taxi will be waiting for you to take you to Roxham. And once you've crossed the road, you'll be offered free accommodation, welfare, health care and school for your children. Roxham, the all-inclusive package is waiting for you. Mr. Speaker, isn't the Immigration Minister Mr. Tart of being laughed at, when will he suspend the safe third country agreement? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. This situation is not a joke. It's important to debate this issue at the House here seriously. Our government cooperated with the province of Quebec and continues negotiations to modernize the safe third country agreement with the U.S. so we can find permanent solutions. Mr. Speaker, my colleague is a looking for disputes, but I'm putting forth their solutions. The member for Lac Saint Jean, we have to be serious. We have a moral duty to welcome asylum seekers. It's a matter of humanity. If someone's life is in danger in their home country, we must respond to their call for help. But what's happening with Roxham Road is ridiculous. The Americans are using this irregular route to absolve themselves of their own responsibility and are inviting refugees to leave for Quebec for reasons that are sometimes anything but humanitarian. What is this government waiting for to suspend the safe third country agreement? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the solution of my friend is just uh, avoiding the issue. There's no magic solution. We need serious solutions. I've had a meeting with my uh, counterpart in Quebec last week to discuss solutions and the role for the federal government to support Quebec. At the same time, our government continues its efforts to modernize the agreement with the U.S. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to treat it seriously, no matter how big a joke the bloc seems to think it may be. The Honourable Member for Lac-Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Immigration doesn't think it's a, a serious thing, but it's also a tragedy. La Presse revealed this morning that dozens of children are crossing alone in Roxham. Children as young as 10 years old are unaccompanied. This is not a joke. The government has known this for years. In 2018, they even added a team to deal with these children, minors who are crossing the road in the forest in winter, risking their lives. It's absolutely irresponsible. What will have to happen for this government to find a safe way to receive Asylum seekers, including these children. The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage, Mr. Speaker, my colleague is right in terms of what he said, but it begs question about his first question. I know my colleague from the Bloc, I have a great deal of respect for him. I know he's serious in all of this, but it's no time to joke. It's no time to joke when he said his first question. We know there are children crossing the road alone. We're talking about uh, men and women and children that are leaving their country under very difficult conditions. And it's no time to joke. We're talking about uh, migrants who are s suffering and we're going to be there to support them. Brent. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Prime Minister, Canadians are living in fear. Under his watch, violent crime up 32 percent, gang-related homicides up 92 percent, and in Toronto last year, 50 percent of all shooting deaths were committed by those already on bail. However, just yesterday, the Liberals voted against our Conservative motion to fix the bail system that they destroyed. When will this Prime Minister admit that his flailed his flawed bail policies are jeopardizing the safety of all Canadians. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Canadians deserve to feel safe and they deserve to be safe. The laws on bail are clear, Mr. Speaker. If somebody poses a threat to public safety, they should not be out on bail. Mr. Speaker, I've undertaken with the provinces and territories uh, to look at what we can do at the federal level with respect to bail. Our priority, Mr. Speaker, remains keeping Canadians safe, and we will move with the provinces together, not just on changing the law, but also administering the bail system in a better way.
Well, member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. The laws on bail are clear. I think the minister meant to say the laws on bail clearly aren't working. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, while this minister was in the classroom, I was in the courtroom running bail hearings. I looked victims in the eye who were victimized by people who were on bail. The reality is, is that violent crime is up 32 percent. Thugs and gangsters with guns are running wild on our streets. When will this minister, after eight years of liberal inaction, end catch and release? The Honourable Minister. service, but I would suggest he go back to the classroom. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, what, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Member will know, what Bill C-74... Order! Order! I'm not sure how much sugar was in everyone's lunch today, but I think there was an overdose. I just want everybody to take a deep breath and calm down. The Honourable Minister, please continue. Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Member will surely know from his experience, what Bill C-75 did was codify Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence. It tightened bail provisions by adding a reverse onus for intimate partner violence. There was already a reverse onus on prohibited weapons. Mr. Speaker, notwithstanding that, we are willing to work with the provinces to see if there are additional measures that we can take. And certainly, we will help the provinces in the administration of the bail system. Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Mr. Speaker, I don't know that I can imagine a comment more out of touch than that which the Liberal Minister just said. I'll remind the Minister that, like him, I also taught at a law school. And unlike him, I don't have to go back to school to see people on the streets who are victimized, to see the statistics of gangland homicides, to see police officers on our streets being killed by people who are on bail. So will this Minister stay out of touch, or will he end catch and release to keep victims safe after eight years of failed Liberal policy? The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition is yelling, uh, 8, 9, 10, you're out, as if this is a sporting event. There is not a person in this chamber who has not been touched by violence. There's not a person in this chamber who doesn't care about the safety of our communities. There is not a person in this country who doesn't want to make us be successful in ensuring that every Canadian is safe and not victimized. The idea that anybody in this chamber, let alone anybody in this government, doesn't care about victims is a deeply offensive concept and totally unhelpful to the debate at hand. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Au Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Prime Minister, we no longer recognize Canada, and for good reason, referring to Bill C-5. Joseph Fessal at the Journal de Montréal said, 
crazy fanatics have taken over our asylum system. One example, a 31-year-old woman who was convicted of repeatedly beating her 11-year-old stepson, depriving him of food and care, was sentenced to 15 months in the comfort of her own home. Why does the Prime Minister always defend criminals rather than helping women and victims? The Honourable Minister of Justice, Mr. Speaker, no other government in the history of Canada has spent the amount of resources we have to help victims. Mr. Speaker, severe crimes deserve severe consequences. That is the spirit behind our amendments to the Criminal Code. Mr. Speaker, we are in full support of our victims. We are revising our system that it'll be more so that it's more flexible and more supportive for victims. And we are going to succeed. Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, the devastation we've seen in Turkey and Syria is horrific. This earthquake comes after nearly 12 years of war and total suffering in Syria. Children are still being pulled from the rubble. It is heartbreaking. Survivors will require an incredible amount of assistance urgently. The government's announcement this morning is a good start, but the scale of this crisis will require more. The humanitarian coalition has launched a joint appeal, as has the Red Cross, and I'm certain that Canadians will contribute generously. Will the government commit to a matching fund to amplify the generosity of Canadians? The Honourable Minister for International Development. Our hearts goes out to all those affected by the, the devastating earthquakes. Our initial response of $10 million is a start. We are conducting a needs assessment to look at more. Uh, and yes, we are looking at a matching fund as well. I was just speaking with the head of UN OJA uh, regarding um, our response, and we're looking at all avenues of support, and we, we will have more to say on this. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Skeena Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, this Friday marks two years since the tugboat in Janika sank near Kitimat, killing Troy Pearson and Charlie Craig. Mm. Yesterday, the owner of that boat was charged with eight counts of negligence. But holding a single company accountable isn't enough to protect the mariners who work up and down the BC coast. For years, workers have been calling for stronger regulations, for mandatory inspections, and for proper enforcement. Two years, two workers dead. And yet this minister hasn't strengthened a single safety measure. Why? The Honourable Minister for Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for his ongoing advocacy on behalf of this issue. He and I have talked about it on numerous occasions, and I want to keep reassuring him that Transport Canada is working with him and other stakeholders on identifying other opportunities for improving our regulations. Safety is paramount, Mr. Speaker. There's an ongoing uh, review of these regulations, but Mr. Speaker, we are committed to having the highest level of safety in Canada. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government has supported Canadian workers with significant investments to defend and expand their rights, implementing legislation such as 10 days of paid sick leave for employees under federal jurisdiction, and soon a ban on replacement workers. Unlike the Conservatives who have relentlessly attacked unions, their members, and Canadian workers through their years in government, we protect Canadians' rights by repealing their anti-worker laws and putting the interests of Canadians first in everything we do. Can the Minister of Labour update this House on what last week's ratification of the Convention on the Prevention of Harassment and Violence in the Workplace means for Canadian workers and their right to a safe and resp respectful mm. workplace. Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Mississauga Streetsville for her question. She is a hard worker. We want to end workplace violence and harassment here in Canada and around the world. That is the aim of the International Labour Organization Convention 190. And I am proud to say that last week that convention was ratified by Canada. We believe in the workers of this country. We stand up for the workers of this country. We put into force paid sick leave. We are introducing legislation to ban replacement workers. And in fact, one of the first things we did was repeal two of the most anti-worker union bashing bills this country has ever seen. Both conservative bills. I am proud to say that this government is leading the fight for workers around the world. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. 
Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, Canadians are struggling to afford the most basic necessities groceries to feed their families, to pay their rent and mortgages, and of course to heat their homes to stay warm this summer. Mandeep Gaur in my writing says that she has to get a second job just to pay the bills. And now the Prime Minister is going to make everything even more expensive by tripling, tripling, tripling the carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we're going to stand and fight for Canadians like Mandeep Gaur. We, we will ensure that they will turn off the carbon tax so they can continue to heat their homes. The Honourable Minister. Let's talk about the Conservative record on taxes. Our government cut taxes on middle-class Canadians twice. The Conservatives voted against. We cut taxes on the hardest-working class Canadians three times, and the Conservatives voted against. We reduced taxes on small businesses, Mr. Speaker, and true to form, the Conservatives voted against. Mr. Speaker, the record in this House on who supports Canadians with reducing taxes is clear. It's us. They keep opposing. We keep delivering. Member for Edmonton, Mel Woods. Mr. Speaker, the problem is that instead of standing up for Canadians, they continue to defend their failed policies. The fact is that the carbon tax through with the carbon tax, they have not met any environmental standard or, or target that they set themselves. Exactly. The Bank of Canada governor admitted that the carbon tax, the Prime Minister's carbon tax, actually contributed to the inflation crisis that we're in right now. And the Parliamentary Budget Officer says that households will pay more in carbon tax than they will get back in rebates. <laughs> the Liberals continue to push these failed policies on uh, with the carbon tax that doesn't even work. Well, they can, but will they, f will they fight with us? Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to fight until they turn off that carbon tax so continue, Canadians can... The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I guess the question many Canadians are wrestling with is which Conservative should they believe? The Conservative who, during the last election campaign, said they believe in climate change and they believe in climate change so much that they would put in place a price on pollution or the Conservatives today who say they don't believe in either climate change or doing anything about it, let alone putting a price on pollution, Mr. Speaker. That is the question that many Canadians are struggling with. Yeah, well, no. Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, Canadians can no longer afford to eat and heat and house themselves. Take, for example, Phyllis, who lives just outside of Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. She turns the heat on in her trailer in the morning. She spends most of her day, Mr. Speaker, in bed with her clothes on to stay warm, and she gives herself a little bit of heat in the evening before turning in for the night. Conservatives will continue to keep the heat on and take the tax off. When will this Liberal government stop blaming everyone else, take some responsibility, and axe the destructive carbon tax? <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Uh, the Honourable Member represents communities that are very much similar in kind to the ones that are in my backyard. And the reality is the policies that we've introduced over the last seven years in government are making a meaningful difference. Look at the Canada Child Benefit, which puts more money in the pockets of 9 out of 10 Canadian families. We changed that program so we stopped sending checks to millionaires like the Conservatives had. Look at the uh, middle class tax cut. We raised taxes on the wealthiest 1% and cut them for the middle class. We increased the guaranteed income supplement. We continue to improve the Canada Pension Plan. Every step of the way, we are focused on low and middle income families to better support them. Every step of the way, the Conservatives vote against them. And I'm happy to take that message to the polls next time. Yeah. Well, member for Cumberland, Colchester. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's absolutely fascinating because my office receives hundreds of emails and phone calls and letters outlining the extreme difficulties that they're having with their finances because of this Liberal government's terrible carbon tax and the terrible inflationist policies, the worst in 40 years. And the, even the Premier of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, Tim Houston, has put forward a comprehensive plan to reduce emissions and actually save Nova Scotians money where this minister lives. How can he vote against such craziness? This makes no sense, Mr. Speaker. When will the Liberal government allow Canadians to keep the heat on and axe the tax? The Honourable Minister for Family. Mr. Speaker, it baffles this House that the Conservatives continue to undermine the fact that climate change is real. It baffles this House mm. and, in fact, all Canadians Absolutely. that Conservatives continue to vote against measures that are actually supporting Canadians, Mr. Yep. Speaker. Time and time again, when we have put forward measures that are helping low- and middle-income Canadians, what have the Conservatives done? They have voted against it. Not only do they have no 
plan, but they obstruct and they deny and they Shame. deflect and they make it harder for Shame. Canadians to get the supports that they need. We're going Awful. to be there, Conservative. L'honorable député. De... The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, hundreds of Canadian Labour Congress workers are up on the hill today. And amongst them, there are the steel workers and the ocean towing workers. From Sorrel Tracy, they are here because the federal government supports the use of scabs in their labour dispute. Even today, Quebec workers are being replaced by scabs, uh, paid three times their salary because the federal government is living 50 years in the past. The minister has done his consultations. He no longer has any excuse for inaction. Will he immediately introduce anti-scab legislation? The Honourable Minister for Labour. Mr. Speaker, in my mandate letter, I'm committed to limiting recourse to replacement workers. We've started consultations with representatives and we'll determine what legislation is to be tabled in this House before the end of next year. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, what is the Minister waiting for? There has been anti-scab legislation in Quebec since 1977. This government is 50 years late. It consults, it thinks, and it shovels from the front. Now, the result, even today, the labour dispute at Ocean Towing is dragging on because of the use of scabs. There are real workers with real needs uh, who are here today because of the minister's inaction that is hurting their families and their right to negotiation. What is he waiting for to introduce anti-scab legislation? The Honourable Minister for Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Workers is, will, will be one of the most significant progress that we have seen for workers in this country. It is something that unions and labor, labor leaders have been asking for years. We on this side of the House will make sure that we get it right. Far from an action, we, we have just finished consultations, thorough consultations with employers and with labor unions. And on this side of the House, on such an important piece of legislation that labor has been asking for for decades, we will get it right. Thank you. The Honorable Member for Calgary, Midnapore. After eight years of this Liberal government, business is skyrocketing at the high-priced consulting firm McKinsey & Company. This government has given McKinsey & Company over $100 million in contracts, wow. including $1.4 million from the Canada Infrastructure Bank, an organization that is chock full of former McKinsey strategists. So why is this government so hell-bent on giving $100 million to close Liberal inside friends while average Canadians are just struggling to get by. Great question. The Honourable Member for Public Works. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And as I uh, explained to the Government Operations Committee yesterday, there has been absolutely no political interference in the award of contracts to McGinsey. Uh, we are, of course, looking very carefully to ensure that all processes and rules and policies have been followed by the Department, by PSPC. And I know that my colleague, the uh, President of the Treasury Board, will also be examining uh, the policies in that uh, department as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. So, in other words, the government's approach to the Liberal McKinsey scandal is to ask this minister to investigate herself. But we found out yesterday at the Government Operations Committee that she lacks a basic understanding of the record and experience of this company, including their relationship with Purdue Pharma. Now, Conservatives have said Liberals investigating themselves is not good enough, which is why we need an independent investigation by Canada's Auditor General. An Auditor General, by the way, who has been disparaged by the Minister of Revenue. But with so many Canadians struggling, will the government support our call today for an independent investigation by the Auditor General into why over a hundred million dollars of contracts the honorable minister the honorable government house leader on this issue uh, the official opposition
opposition has cast all kinds of aspersions uh, that have already been demonstrated to not be true, uh, saying relationships exist that don't exist, uh, and furthermore, uh, holding out uh, that these decisions are made by the government when they know that it's made by the uh, independent, nonpartisan public service. Canada is known around the world for the quality of the contracts that we engage in. We have incredibly rigorous processes that govern these, and the reality is contracts allow government to expand their services without it permanently expanding the number of employees. It's an intelligent way to use resources, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Lizzie Chemin Levy. Mr. Speaker, inflation is at its highest level. The cost of housing has doubled, and families will pay over $1,000 more for food this year. 1.5 million Canadians go to food banks. That's eight years of, Prime Minister's, of this Prime Minister's governance. What's he doing? He'd rather give over $100 million in contract to a company that is apparently replacing the public service. Can the Prime Minister explain clearly how this insane spending is helping Canadians who are struggling? The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, it is difficult to hear the Conservatives say that they want to help Canadians. But every time they vote against measures that will help these very Canadians. On this side, we are committed to helping Canadians because we understand that the cost of living is going up, and that is exactly the reason for which we have acted. If the Conservatives were actually sincere in their desire to help Canadians, they could do something simple vote with us to help Canadians. The Honourable Member for Madawaska, Restigouche. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians deserve a healthy environment and safe communities. Since uh, CEPA was last reformed 20 years ago, chemicals have become an increasing part of our daily lives and economy. Canadians want environmental protection legislation that addresses 21st century issues with 21st century science. Can the Minister for the Environment and Climate Change tell us about the importance of the adoption of Bill S5? The Honourable Minister for the Environment. I want to thank parliamentarians for their work on this bill, ensuring that we have the right tools to protect human health and the environment are key steps in our government's plan. With S5, we would first re we would recognise for the first time in Canadian law the right of every Canadian to a healthy environment. Mr. Speaker, this is an important step forward for the health of our country and the environment. Member for South Shore St. Margaret's. After eight years of this Prime Minister's incompetence, Canadians are out of money. Now we learn of more liberal ineptitude. Medicago closed its doors after receiving more than $173 million of Canadian taxpayer money to develop vaccines. And these Liberals pre-purchased $600 million of these vaccines that have yet to be produced or delivered. And this week, government officials have said that Canadians are on the hook to pay for these vaccines. So why is this Prime Minister paying millions of dollars of taxpayer money to a foreign company for vaccines we didn't receive? <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Innovation. I'd like to say, I'd like to thank the member for his question. It's a member that I respect a lot, is actually my critic. But this is not the time for recrimination, Mr. Speaker. That's the time for solutions. That's exactly what we're doing on this side of the, of the House, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I spoke with the CEO of, the, of Mitsubishi Chemical in Japan, Mr. Speaker, because we all understand that in this House, what we should care about is to preserve jobs, Mr. Speaker, to preserve the plant in Quebec City, and to make sure that we keep the technology, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly what we're, we're doing. Doing. That's what we're going to fight for the workers because we know that this is a technology that could save lives in the future. Honourable <laughs> Member for Halliburton, Quarter Lakes, Brock. Speaker, after eight years of this Prime Minister, the cupboards are bare. While Canadians struggle to feed their families and pay their mortgages, Liberals continue to invest in friends and ghost companies. $120 million in contracts to Liberal insiders at McKinsey, and that number just keeps rising. Incredibly, experts say their so-called services weren't even needed. But wait, there is more. No way. <laughs> True story. Two, million, two billion for the finance minister to invest in a company that doesn't even exist. Wow. Speaker, when will this prime minister take accountability, stop its waste, and getting results for taxpayers? Great question. The honourable government house leader. 
Mr. Speaker, as I've uh, iterated uh, previously in this House, uh, the, uh, the work that we engage with uh, and decisions that are made to engage in those contracts are an independent process. They're run by the public service. They allow the public service to expand their impact without permanently expanding the number of employees that are there. That public service has been there for Canadians through an incredibly difficult time in the pandemic to make sure that we deliver critical services to Canadians. And what these contracts allow the public service to do is to expand their impact without permanently expanding the number of employees that are there. Now, there's many, many wild accusations made by the other side. Already, many of them have been disproved. They have the opportunity in committee to be able to explore these issues and whatever other conspiracies they wish. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, we've been trying to get this uh, Prime Minister to understand since 2017 that he needs to renegotiate the safe third country agreement with the United States to resolve the situation at Roxham Road. But instead of taking this situation seriously, he lets it fester. And now we learn that New York City is offering free bus tickets to migrants heading north to seek asylum in Canada, Roxham Road. Why won't the Prime Minister take responsibility for his failure to close the Roxham Crossing so we can help people who are legally waiting in Canada's immigration backlog to get in? The Honourable Minister for Immigration. I assure the Honourable Member that we're taking the issue very seriously and are working to verify the claims that were reported in the Post just a few days ago. The reality is the long-term solution is being negotiated with the United States through the modernization of the Safe Third Country Agreement, and we're working very closely with our provincial counterparts in the meantime to ensure that as they work to support some of the vulnerable people who have made their way into communities, that their basic needs are being met. Speaking of their needs being met, Mr. Speaker, I would point out to the Honourable Member that it is one of his colleagues on that side of the House that refused service to a vulnerable person on the basis that they sought asylum in Canada in an irregular way. We need to treat these issues with compassion in all moments, and we'll continue to do so, uh, do so on this side of the House. The Honourable Member for Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, since yesterday we've had such devastating news from Syria and Turkey. As we've heard in this House today and across the country, our thoughts and hearts are with everyone affected by this these major earthquakes and who have sustained such unendurable loss. In this difficult time, countries around the world are mobilizing to provide urgent support following this great catastrophe. Can the Minister of International Development tell all Canadians more about what our government is doing to support those Canadians, or sorry, those people affected by this earthquake? Great question. The Honourable Member, or Minister for International Development. Mr. Speaker, our government stands ready to support uh, those affected by these devastating uh, earthquakes. This is why today I authorized an initial emergency humanitarian uh, uh, response of $10 million to support the people of Turkey uh, and Syria. And this is in addition to the $50 million of funding that we provided for disaster response in Syria. And our international partners on the, on the ground have already initiated, initiated emergency uh, response activities. Uh, plus, we're also uh, 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 conducting a need assessments because we will be doing more, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Indigenous peoples are overrepresented in the homeless population. The parliamentary budget officer said it would require $27.5 billion to close this housing gap. The Liberals' allocation of $300 million over five years is a drop in the bucket. Mm. While the NDP forced the Liberals to roll this out over two years for urgent need, more needs to be done. The National Urban, Rural and Northern Indigenous Housing Coalition is calling on this government to commit $6 billion in budget 2023. The NDP fully supports this. Will the Liberals make this commitment to help end the housing crisis for Indigenous peoples. The Honourable Minister for Housing. We are fully committed to working with Indigenous people to co-develop an urban, rural and northern Indigenous housing strategy. Through Budget 2022, we are investing over $4 billion in Indigenous housing through co-developing processes, including for the urban, rural and northern Indigenous housing strategy. Some of that work is already underway. More than 41% of all the units delivered on the, under the Rapid Housing Initiative are going up in indigenous communities because the need is there, but also indigenous communities are stepping up and leveraging federal dollars to build rapid 
housing for their communities. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well done. Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, too many seniors in Canada are in serious poverty. Last week, I moved a motion to apply equal OAS payments to all seniors, regardless of age. And sadly, this government voted against it. My office has been contacted by a senior who is now making a human rights complaint about Service Canada. Why? Because this government is participating in discrimination because of age. When will the minister finally admit that she's allowing some seniors fall below the poverty line and lifting others who need it? Do it. It's the time. Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister for Seniors. That seniors are facing. That's precisely why we have been there for them every single step of the way, Mr. Speaker. That is why we doubled the GST credit, Mr. Speaker, for six months. That is why we've increased the guaranteed income supplement that has helped over 900,000 seniors, Mr. Speaker. That has lifted 45,000 seniors out of poverty. That is exactly why, Mr. Speaker, we have increased our old age security by 10 percent last year. And that is why we're, of course, enhanced the CPP. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we're going to continue to support all Canadians, including seniors. Thank here, you. Here, here. That's all the time we have for question period today. I wish to draw the attention of members to the presence in the gallery of the Honourable Mickey Avery, Amory, Minister of Children's Service for the province of Alberta.